Good afternoon, everyone. It's time to shift gears and get back into God's word. We're here to fellowship around his word. We know that this is the utmost importance for the believer in Christ. And so it kind of reminds me when we were, when the disciples were with Jesus, we see throughout the gospel accounts, Jesus gathering with his 12 to pull together and instruct them and to guide them in the word to prepare them for the mission and the ministry that was forthcoming, which was to radically impact the world, to go and make disciples of all people. And so now on this side of eternity, God has tasked us with the same responsibility and objective, which is to make an impact. But what's uniquely different about us and the disciples is that we now are living in what's called the dispensation of the church age. And with the dispensation of the church age, we have the opportunity to utilize the spiritual resources that God has given to us through the agency of God, the Holy Spirit. So the indwelling presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gives us resources to live during the times that we're living in now. So although I would venture to say that I'm sure we have all had a rough week, some of us had gone through challenges, difficulties, and the like, we have everything we would need for life and godliness as we've seen in the past, according to Second Peter. And so we have everything, especially each other. And so as we pull together, we must recognize that as we assemble in his name, it's for the sole purpose of getting grounded in his word to study and show ourselves to prove a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, while at the same time being encouraged ourselves and be recharged so that no matter what life threw at us during the week, we can stand, we can still continue standing and make sense and navigate through life itself. So, but before we do, let me just share the preparatory verses as customary, which says that the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who simply believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved for by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So let's just pause for a moment of silence and utilize 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We sometimes call this the rebound technique, which allows us to recover the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, thus allowing him to have access to us so that he he can illuminate the truths that we're going to look at and empower us for service. So let's just pause for a moment of silence and be, um, let's get right with God through the use of 1 John 1 9. Let's pray and then I'll open in prayer. <clears throat> Father, once again, we are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, there's so much going on around the world and, uh, we are gathered because we're committed to you, ultimately, because we know, Lord, that uh, before we are going to be finished here in this world, you have tasked us with a major responsibility, which is to make an impact and to commit to people the message that has been committed to your initial disciples, namely, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And I realize from time to time, we may not be in the right mood to do this. But at the same time, we recognize, Father, that it costs you your own precious son, his life, that we might have life, life and life everlasting. So help us to see the significance and the importance of this so that we can ultimately please and honor you in all that we say, think and do. Father, we ask all of these things through Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen.
Okay, we're moving through the basic series, and you'll recall that I have been talking about abiding and believing, in the, and it's part of the phase two aspect of salvation. So if you see right in front of you, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Do you see that in front of you? The, it's color-coded blue and yellow for a reason. So be, the reason why they're going to be condemned is because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So when we talk to our unbelieving friends or family members, they're not going to go to hell or the lake of fire because they're a bad person. It has nothing to do with their sin nature. It does, has nothing to do with their sin. They're going to go to hell or the lake of fire, ultimately, because they have not believed in him. You see that there in John 3, 18? He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. So they don't even have to do anything. All they have to do is just be born in this world and go through life, just like we are. And if that's the case then they will die because they stand in condemnation because of the fact that they have not believed in Jesus Christ. So I, I'm going to navigate through some, a couple more verses here so that you can see the, the full force of this. The next verse, I think, is also very telling. It says the following. Look at verse 8.8. Eight. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We talked about this last week, that when we were going through Romans, there is a difference between those in the flesh and those who walk by means of the flesh. So those two are different concepts altogether. There are those who are in the flesh and those who walk by means of the flesh. We need to be clear on that. Can a believer be in the flesh? Is a believer ever in the flesh? The answer is no. The believer, once they're in Christ, they can never undo that. So Romans 8.8 8 is very important. That preposition in is very, very key to understanding what we're talking about here. Those in the flesh, meaning their position cannot please God. So unbelievers cannot do anything that would please or impress God. So if an unbeliever visits our church today and gives a million dollars, that doesn't move the hand of God. That doesn't please him at all because he has not fulfilled John 3, 18, the very first verse. He has not believed in him. And as such, they stand condemned until they believe in Christ. So condemnation comes to those who are in the flesh who have not yet believed in Christ. So the, the next verse is also very important. This I think will help us really drive this home. And uh, you might remember me talking about this a year ago, two years ago. In Adam, all die. Even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. So take a look at the blue on 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and lift your eyes up to John 3, 18. The ones in Christ are the ones who believe in Jesus. You see that? He who believes in him is not condemned. The one in yellow is Adam. Every person born, every baby born is positionally in Adam. You're either in Adam or in Christ. Um, if you're in Christ, that tells me you at one time have believed in him. So you're no longer condemned, John 3.18. So our objective as a church, as believers in Christ, is to pull together and to make a conscious effort to look for the opportunities that God places before us via, uh, via the internet, text messages, uh, phone calls, visitations. These are part and parcel of doing the work that will ultimately impress and please our Heavenly Father. That's our goal. So... Please notice, uh, in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all shall be what? Made alive. Now, so you're wondering, well, I, I don't really care to share the gospel. I don't, I'm not you, Pastor Freddie. I'm not a pastor, so you do the sharing. 
Well, please notice what's going to happen here. <clears throat> See that all those in Adam die and all in Christ shall be what? Made alive? Wait a minute. I thought we're alive already. We are. You're seated there. I'm standing here. You're listening online. You're alive in Christ, right? But this is what I've been trying to um, drive home. There is a nuance here. There's power that can be ours in phase two. What does phase one say? It assures us that we're saved from what? The penalty of sin. Great, right? What about phase two? Saved from the power of sin. That links to 1 Corinthians 15, 22, which is power. So you're sitting here saying, I don't really care to share the gospel. I'm too busy. I'm, I'm not, that's, that's not my spiritual gift. Well, watch this, okay? In Adam, all die. That's their position. But in Christ, all shall be made alive. What's that mean? Well, glad you asked. Look at First Corinthians, uh, Romans 8, 11. Remember this? What does it say? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So if we link that with 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die, in Christ all shall be made alive. If you look at Romans 8 and 11, right here in front of you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. We have mortal bodies right now that ache, that have pain. We have back aches, headaches, knee aches, and the rest. But God himself will empower us through the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead to give life to your mortal bodies. What kind of life? It's the spiritual life that I think we have been searching for, the key to doing the things that God would want us to do, but not trying to will it and say, I'm trying to be a good Christian. I'm trying to obey. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And how many times have I said, it's not about trying, it's about renewing our mind, right? Don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. But see, look at what we're discovering together. The spirit of God is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. That's resurrection power, remember? He raised from Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. If he does, and the scripture says he does when we compare it with other scriptures, we're in Christ. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So please notice there is this power that's going to exude and it's going to come upon our mortal bodies. And this is phase two. This is what I've been trying to really uh, illuminate and try to, to, to expand on because there's some things, you, you know, I, I've been discovering that, you know, with phase two, all these verses seem to point to having power. And, but, and I've searched long and hard for a lot of uh, books on discipleship that will go deeper into this power because I, I, I've noticed that the verses that I'm citing each and every time and looking at consistently as I prepare for this series or a, a teaching of some sort of my personal time. Remember, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then when you look at what he does in uh, Matthew 4, he was able to uh, defend himself against the devil. And you might be saying, well, yeah, but he's God. Well, the truth is, he is God, but he's also man. We, he is the God-man, also known as what? What, what do we call that when God the, God the Son has two natures? What do we call that? Doctrine of what? Teaching of what? Hypostatic union. He's 100% God, 100% man. Is that important? Yes, it is. Why? Because he lived his life from his humanity. He was the one who left us the prototype, the example to show us it is possible to live just like him. That doesn't mean we'll never not sin anymore, but it does show that as we're studying the scriptures closely, 
Remember last week we talked about how Paul argues, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? It is the power of God to salvation. Salvation from what? Hell? I'm a believer already. Well, remember those sins listed from 18 to 32? Uh, um, haters of God, disobedient, cheaters, liars, homosexuality, and the rest. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel where it's the power of God to deliverance, to save from all of those things. And he lists all kinds of details. And we discovered that God abandons the wrath of God that's currently revealed right now is his abandonment. That's the worst thing to happen is to for God to abandon us to ourselves because we have suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. We don't want doctrine anymore. We don't want church anymore. We don't want the Bible anymore. And so if that continues, God will eventually turn us over to ourselves so that we'll have a full impact. And the realization, is this what we really want? So God turns people over to themselves who continue to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And that's a bad thing. The devil is not our worst enemy. Our sin nature is. So we can be saved from the power of sin. And if you look here again, Romans 8, 11, it's all wrapped up in this verse here. It's he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life. I, I understand that to mean power. He will give power to your mortal bodies. The, the fact that the Holy Spirit chose to reveal to us it's our mortal bodies is, leads me to believe that this is not eschatological. In other words, it's not future. This is not something our, where someone could say, oh, this is referring to our glorified bodies. He's going to give us something that's going to... Um, He's going to give life to our mortal bodies. Uh, that's talking about the glorified bodies. No, it's not referring to that because he'll give life now to your mortal body. So that's distinct. Will you have a glorified body in the future? You will. You'll have a body that consists of flesh and blood, just like Jesus did, and but without sin. So, but that's future. That's eschatological. That's not something he's talking about now. He's talking about this in Romans 8, 11, about giving a kind of power to our mortal, feeble bodies, our mortal bodies, our weak bodies, so that we can live for Christ. So when you sit there and argue with yourself, I shouldn't do this, I should do this, I know I should commit, I know I should help, you know, that internal tug of war that's clearly seen in Romans 7 is the struggle that we all go through. And even in Romans 7, Paul says, well, at least in my mind, I can serve God. Because he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. That's the whole argument in Romans 7. And then in Romans 8, he comes up with the realization that it's not by your own efforts. It's a mindset. Remember, if you set your minds on the things of the flesh, you will receive death. And we saw in James that that refers to premature death. That could be the sin unto death. So if a, if a person continues to live a life of sin, they could die prematurely. If they overdose on drugs, alcohol, and they get into a wreck, yeah, they could die early. And we saw in 1 Corinthians 11, where the church was uh, living in, in blatant open sin, and so some of them were weak, sick, and some died. Some went to sleep. That word sleep is a euphemism for a believer who dies prematurely. Ananias and Sapphira is also another example of someone who was taken out early because they simply lied. So, but now with all those things there and all the disciplinary action that God can take on the son or daughter of God, we're also discovering I'm discovering and I'm, I'm trying to, to really dig deep into this because I do believe there is an empowerment that comes through the word of God coupled with God, the Holy Spirit. And I, it's starting to come out, um, it's a little bit more pronounced as I'm uh, searching on this. And like I said before, the, the area of discipleship is far and few. There's only a handful of books that I have discovered that really dig deep into this as far as interconnecting all these terms that relate to this. Because see, the bottom line is this. If, if we believe phase one, phase two, phase three in our heart, 
Phase one is saved from the penalty of sin. Phase two is saved from the power of sin. And phase three is saved from the presence of sin. If we believe in that entire salvation package, well, it's our, it's our objective. It's our responsibility to find out how to experience the salvation from the power of sin right now, because that's where we're at in the timetable of God as far as the salvation package. Something took place in the past. So that's done with. We don't have to worry about the penalty of sin because you and I have been declared righteous, but now it's about living under his empowerment. Because when you say walk by means of the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, I get sometimes I get a lot of people say, well, yeah, I believe that verse, but you can tell there's no victory in there. There's no confidence. And so I think there's more to it than just saying, oh, I know that verse in Galatians, walk by means of the spirit and you will not fulfill the dictates of the flesh. But the truth is, if we are going to have a heart to heart talk, we're going to sit there and say, well, you know, I still struggle with this, this, this and this. And that's what I'm trying to 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 see what's found in scripture so that we can live with confidence because Part of the reason why we're not willing to share, at least in my opinion, to stand up for Christ is because deep down inside, we're not really clear on certain truths. Like, yes, I'm saved. I believe in Christ. But if people know the real me, if people know what I struggle with, then they might question whether or not I've even been born again. And that's what I want us to address with confidence. And so... Everything thus far is related to being in Christ and noticing that we will experience a power, Romans 8, 11, that is going to come from God, the Holy Spirit. If the spirit him, of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give power to your mortal bodies. What kind of power? The kind of power that will allow you to set your minds on the things of the spirit so that you can experience life and peace. Life and peace. So we saw already Paul started to build on that, that it's a mindset. If your mind is set on the things of the flesh, death, right? Carnality. And so now you have an impoverished spiritual life. And now guess what? If we regard iniquity in our hearts, he does not hear us. That's the Old Testament version of 1 John 1, 9. So if we have sin in our life, in our hearts, he doesn't even hear us. So now we have the spiritual life. We're living the Christian life and we have no answered prayer. And we're wondering what in the world is going on. Could it be that in the, in the category of discipleship, because it's volitional, meaning we are commanded and we're not following him. Could it be that that's the reason why we're, we're, we're anemic in phase two? I think that might be the case. So let's, let's move on now and see what else we can discover. <clears throat> Look at John 8, 31 and 32 here. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, third class condition, meaning you, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we're, like I said last time, last week as well, that we live in a culture claiming what's true for you may not be true for me. So we don't believe people don't believe in absolute truths anymore. We're more into our feelings. And so what feels right for you may not feel right for me. And so I don't want that business. I don't want that Jesus business. But remember, biblical truth is God's viewpoint on every matter. And it, it is not subject to redefinition. What do I mean by that? Why did I say that? Because you're going to have family members and friends co-workers who don't agree with what you're doing and what you believe in, but hold the line. Because, you know, God already told us that if they hated Jesus, they're going to hate you as well. So we can expect that. We can expect the resistance, that they don't like, they don't accept Jesus because they prefer darkness. But we've got to hold the lines. We've got to lock shields and hold the line because they're, they don't even know that they're condemned already. They don't know that. 
They think they're fine as long as they don't hurt anybody, as long as, they, as long as they pay their taxes, they're fine. They're not fine. They're condemned. Their status is condemnation. They're headed for trouble. Less we step in and intervene with God's help, with our volition. Once we recognize the, the, the real purpose for why we share the gospel, that they're in Adam, and see the significance there, then we can make the adjustments and we can live under his empowerment. The boldness will come as a result of Romans 8, 11 and Romans 5, 8 through 9. Uh, therefore, we've been saved and justified by his death. What more now through his life? We saw that last week. So there's all these verses that are showing us that there's inerrant power that comes in phase two. We're saved and we could be saved more, in other words. And that's the spiritual power that I believe we need uh, so badly. So notice in this verse here, believers are not going to automatically become disciples. And uh, the idea is they must remain, they must stay, they must abide. And so if you do, the byproduct of that would be truth and freedom. You see that there, the truth shall make you free. So if you abide, you will receive the, the rewards will be truth and freedom. Freedom from the bondage of sin, the power of sin. You see that there? The, this is Jesus speaking to the believers. Please notice, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, okay? If you abide in me, third class condition, which simply means you might or you might not. It depends on what? Your volition. Are you willing? Are you willing to follow? So it's not automatic. See what it says here? To, he's speaking to the ones who are believers now. To, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him. So these are believers who acquiesce to him. And he says, if you abide in my word, maybe you will, maybe you won't. You are my disciples indeed. And if you do, this is what's going to happen. You shall know the truth, and that truth shall make you free. So please notice that being a disciple and abiding is not, that doesn't come automatically. It requires a volition. You have to make a decision. If you abide in my word. So what if you don't? What does that mean? That means you're not his disciples. That means you're not going to experience the truth that will set you free, which all uh, includes Romans 1, the power to being spared from the ongoing onslaught of the flesh. Remember the abandonment to self? And so we have, the, we, we see that if we're embarrassed of the gospel, we're suppressing the truth like this. This is biblical truth right here. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples, but it's con contingent upon your volition. Not all, not all Christians, let me be frank, not all Christians will abide. Not all Christians will follow. So therefore, not all Christians are going to be his disciples. And therefore, all, not all Christians are going to receive the truth. And not all Christians are going to be set free, made free. It depends on our volition. It's a volitional act. So these things are volitional. So if you continue in my word, you are my disciples. Okay. Notice that you can believe in Jesus, but not continue in his work or in his word. It's possible to believe in Jesus. We come together and believe in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise. Praise the Lord. Sing songs to him. We're believing in him, but not necessarily abiding in his word or following him. <clears throat> you're not automatically progressing through phase two, in other words. So if you're not automatically moving through phase two, you're not automatically going to experience the power that comes through God, the Holy Spirit, and that's all revealed in his word. That transformative power and impact from Romans 12, 2, uh, where re the renewing of the mind will transform you. Remember that word there, that metamorpho is 
likened to the caterpillar that turns to a completely different um, insect. It becomes now a butterfly. And so that magical transformation is going to be the result of a renewed mind. Again, guess what? That requires your volition. Not everyone is going to want to get into the word. Not everyone's going to want to abide and be his disciples. Not everyone is going to want to or care to be his disciples. And, and therefore, they're not going to be in the truth that will set them free. And so they won't experience the power uh, being saved from the onslaught of the sin nature that is internal. Are you still saved? Yes. Will you still go to heaven? Yes. And I know some of you might be saying, well, that's as long as I'm going to heaven, that's that's fine. Well, the truth is we still have to deal with life because whether you like it or not, you're going to be faced with decisions. And internally, you have to make a decision that's ultimately going to line up with God's will and his way. And if not, you're going to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and sense his displeasure. And then you're going to say, uh, I, I don't think I should. And, and you're going that turmoil is going to be a reality in your life. But more importantly, you're not going to experience the power that comes with the word coupled with God, the Holy Spirit. So having said that, now let me just um, take us through a passage now that we're familiar with. You remember this, uh, John 15, 4. This is a place, and up to verse 6, this is a passage that a lot, many of Christians have jerked way out of context, and they've thought, they've said that you can lose your salvation in this passage here, but we're going to look closely and see what it's really referring to. Many have ta taught that if you don't abide in Christ, you'll lose your salvation, but that's not what Jesus is teaching here. Let's look at what he's teaching here. Abide in me and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. He's talking to who? Contextually, he's talking to his disciples. I'm the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Something worth pointing out, too as well, is you see this abide here in John 15. This word abide in verse 4 is what's called, it, it comes from the Greek word meno. It's the eris active imperative of the Greek word meno. And the reason why I bring that out is eris tense is a point in time. Active voice means the subject is producing the action of the verb, meaning to abide, and the mood of command means that it's not optional. You are, get, in other words, you're commanded to abide. So in John 15, we're commanded to abide in him. In John 8, if it's conditioned upon the volition, why, why, are there, why is there the option in John 8, but here it's commanded? Hmm. Here he's commanding his disciples to abide abide in him and what for well what does it say as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you you can't be productive you can't bear fruit apart from me unless you abide in me and that word meno that greek word meno means to remain stay in him in his word and we'll develop that in a little bit more but the, the metaphor here is of that of horticulture okay so you and I are branches and he's the vine. And he says, we have to remain in him in order for us to be productive. We can't bear any fruit lest we are abiding in Christ because Christ is the vine here. You are the branches. He abides in me. I in him bears what? Much fruit. So there's an example of production. There's, there's, um, the word here is he who abides in me will bear much fruit. The, the productive believer, as he's abiding, as she's abiding in Christ, will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And when you look at John 15, 9, I believe, or 8 or 9, by this my Father is glorified. So we glorify the Father as we're bearing much fruit, not just some fruit once in a while, hit and miss, 
It's when we abide in him, that's it's by, the byproduct is the consequence to that is bearing much fruit. Do you see that there? He who abides in me and I in him. Now there's a relational term, that fellowship, that relationship is amplified in verse five. He abi who abides in me, I in him, bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. I So we abide in, he who abides in me and I in him, it's reciprocal here. So please notice that in four and five, abiding is now commanded. And I think the reason why is because here he's talking to his elite. He's talking to his committed circle of disciples. In John 8, remember the, the Jews just believed. They just became a believer. They were fascinated by his teaching. And then you, you remember they John chapter 4, many of them believed, right? And so they're now fascinated by Jesus. Could this be the Messiah? Remember what Mary said? Martha, Mary said, and she said, um, the lady at the well. And so they all came to hear him out and hear him speak. And so we see the fascination and they came. And now when you get to John 8, the Jews, it says many of them believe, the ones who believe, he spoke to them. And he said, well, if you really want to follow me, you have to abide in my word. So he, here's these newbies who just became believers. And now he's saying, look, here's the next step. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Here, abide. So I take John 15 as for us. We're already believers. We have been believers for a number of years now. So now he's saying, look, don't you know you have to abide in me? You have to remain in me, stay in my word. Because if you do, you'll be productive. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the flow here. But notice what it says in verse 6. This is what I wanted to show you. Because sometimes this becomes a problem passage for some. Because some pastors, unfortunately, teach that this could, be re, um, this could result in the lake of fire or hell. Because they take this and jerk it way out of context. Look at what it says in front of you. If anyone does not abide in me, Jesus speaking, right? Anyone who does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Uh-oh. Well, I thought we, we have uh, eternal security. How would you answer this? It says they're burned. The, if anyone doesn't abide in me, very clear, whoever doesn't remain in him, in his word, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. <clears throat> so many pastors have taught that if you don't abide, you will lose your salvation. And they cite this passage here, right here, John 15, uh, culminating in verse six. But notice, there's no reason that fire is literal here since the other elements are allegorical. Uh, branches, fruit, vine, these are all terms. These are horticulture metaphors. This is so far. If the branch is not real and the vine is not real, Jesus isn't a real vine and we're not real branches. We don't take this literally. This is a metaphor. He's giving this imagery so that the disciples who were there seated at his feet next to him could learn as the master himself was saying, look, you're going, to, you're, you're going to be going solo pretty soon. So just know that apart from me, you can do nothing. So you're a few. You're only 12. And the only way to make it is to be, abide in me. Stick with me. Okay. And, uh, and then he goes on to say, well, what about this burn part? Well, notice the word burn. And um, it doesn't say burned up, right? So it's, they're not consumed. And the imagery of fire is, um, again, this is um, a temporal judgment. In scripture, fire is a, a common metaphor for temporal judgment. Uh, Jesus is saying that a non-abiding believers prove, uh, well, that, that some would say that uh, the non-abiding believers prove that they're not true believers based on this verse here. But that's not the case here, as I'd said before, we don't want to take 
this literally because the branches are not literal, the vine is not literal, therefore the fire is not literal. It's taken in a metaphor because the branches are metaphors, uh, the vine is metaphor, so the fire has to be metaphorical too. Otherwise, we're going to get into a big mess. Um, but an easy way to deal with this when talking with someone who wants to argue and say, no, I, obviously my church teaches you can go to hell if you don't abide in Christ. Well, look at what it says here. Same context. Remember, context, context, context is key. Always consult the context. Always find out who is he writing to. Find out if there's any clues in the passage. This is John 15, uh, three verses prior. We were looking at verse 6, but now in verse 3, it says the following. You are already what? Clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. So his disciples were already clean. Um, so this is a this is not talking about a non-abiding or someone who lost their salvation because they're already clean. And if you look at verse two, I believe they're in Christ, every branch in me. Talking about position, right? Remember that key word, that preposition in is so key. If you look at John, let me make sure I'm quoting it correctly here. I believe it's John 15, 2. Let me just check my reference here and just to make sure I'm not saying anything that's. Yes, in verse 2, it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. So they're already, and then when you get to verse 3, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So every branch in me, unbelievers are not considered a branch. They're never in Christ because they've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So they can't be referring to an unbeliever. It's referring to a believer. And when they are not going to abide, then the metaphor of fire, now we can link that with um, the disciplining hand of God, where instead of being burned up, it's burned. It's almost like an instant it's a, a uh, instantaneous um, felt uh, pain as opposed to being consumed by being burned up. The term burnt seems like it's a temporary um, pain or sensation and as opposed to being burned up completely. So the metaphor, again, is the idea of um, <clears throat> temporal judgment or, or the disciplining hand of God when you Take it through when you look at 1 Corinthians 3, uh, our, our works will be judged and the, the eyes of Christ are going to judge the, the works that we do and check the motives of the heart. But we'll, the, if it gets burned up, we'll be saved as through fire. So we're, God is going to judge us with his eyes and it's going to test the works, but we're still saved even though it gets consumed and burned up in fire in, as he judges our works that as we're standing before him, 1 Corinthians 3, wood, hand, stubble, um, and so on, gold, silver, and precious stones. So the idea, again, is this idea of temporal judgment, the disciplining hand of God. Again, the simple way to answer it without going too into all the details is um, branches, vines, the gardener, the vine dresser, which is the father, these are all metaphors to for Jesus to clearly communicate to his 12, his disciples, that he says, look, apart from me, you can do nothing. And likewise, we can't do anything apart from him. And it's vital for us to stay in him, in his word, fellowship and the rest. Okay. So that's John 15, 3. And you'll notice that he says in here in verse 5, two verses later, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So if we're in him, we'll bear much fruit. That's the byproduct of abiding in him. When we have a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, we'll bear much fruit. And he then he says, for without me, you can do nothing. So the negative out, there is a negative outcome for the one who doesn't abide, but salvation remains intact. The negative outcome is that without him, without abiding in him, we can do nothing of value have nothing of value. Since this is the opposite of what the verse calls us to do, it means that the one who doesn't abide will bear no fruit. 
Are we saved because we bear fruit? No, we're saved because we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Faith alone in Christ alone. However, we, we abide if we want to bear fruit. Scripture makes it clear that there are saved people who will not abide in Christ, as I mentioned earlier, and non-abiding believers will do nothing of value, according to this verse. For without me, you can do nothing, no, no value. For the one who doesn't abide will bear no fruit. However, if we, if we do abide or remain in him and his word, we will bear much fruit. Now, we've covered a lot of ground these past several weeks, right? We looked Last week, we looked at the Romans passage, how people suppress the truth and the wrath of God is currently being revealed. We've also, if you'll recall, the week before that, we looked at the, the woman at the well and how Jesus interacted with the woman and evangelized and reached out to her. And his, his uh, conversation with her led to conversion. And she went out and ministered to the entire city. Remember that? I don't know if you remember the first time we saw the concept of abide or the word abide in our studies these past few weeks, but I want to take us through and show us. So for with me, you can do nothing for without me, you can do nothing, but notice this passage here. Remember this in John four forty. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there for what? Two days, John 4, 40. So you may not have realized this, but the first time we came across the word abide was shortly after the woman at the well invited the city to see the man who told him her everything. Remember, come see a man who told me everything. What did, she, what did Jesus tell her? Well, you, you've had five husbands. The guy you're with isn't even your husband. Remember that? So she said, hey, could this be the one? Could this be the Messiah? So notice the words in green here. The word stay and stayed are the same Greek word that Jesus uses when he says, abide in my word, which is found here. John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if we take this word here, if the word meno, the word abide, is the same word here in John 440, look at it like this. Then we can uh, conclude based on a comparison of text. If if the word here meno it means to stay or remain stayed there are two days, abide in my word would be like saying, stay with me, keep doing what I teach. So if you stay with my stay in my word. You are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So this staying with him, staying with his word. And let me show you something else um, from 1 John this time. So the idea is if you stay in my word, then you are my disciples. And then you are experiencing phase two salvation. And what's that referring to? Save from the power of sin. So the more that we're in phase two, the more we're going to be transformed, the more that we're going to experience life to our mortal bodies, power to our mortal bodies to do those things that are right. As we're setting our minds on the things of the spirit, life and peace. As we catalog all these truths and recognize the volitional aspect of each of these truths, it requires our volition. Then the more that we're consistently making the right decisions, the more we're going to experience more life, more peace on our, our, on our daily, uh, our daily, daily living, the spiritual living. I like Dr. Chafer's definition of the spirituality. Spirituality is um, when a believer is rightly adjusted to God, the Holy Spirit. See, you and I are rightly adjusted to Jesus Christ at the moment of faith. We're rightly adjusted to Jesus Christ by faith in Jesus Christ. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. However, being rightly adjusted to the Holy Spirit will unlock the power needed 
to go through life itself, to live in victory. Yes, we'll continue to sin, but the more that we love time in phase two, salvation under his empowerment, it's like working out in a gym. We're not going to see the results tomorrow, but if we stay in the gym regularly and if we're adjusting ourselves to reflect what we're, the, what we're trying to accomplish, which is to have a, a different physique, a stronger body, a healthier um, disposition about ourselves by eating properly, exercising regularly, then we should see results in time. And likewise, the more we're spending time in phase two by making conscious decisions to abide in his word, to recognize that we should not suppress the truth and unrighteousness, but instead we should abide in him, take the principles and the mandates in scripture to, and apply that to life, then we're in phase two, which is where the power is. That's where God, the Holy Spirit is no longer grieved. Remember the two negatives in the whole, with regards to the Holy Spirit is do not grieve, do not quench the Holy Spirit. So if we're not grieving, we're not quenching the Holy Spirit, we're fully, we have access to his empowerment. He will now then allow us to be illuminated as we uh, get into the truth. Our patience will start to develop over time. Now the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, that is a byproduct of a volitional act of the believer as he or she is staying more in tune with phase two, by looking at verses like this, abide in his word. So you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. While you're doing that and abiding in his truth, you'll be empowered. You'll, you're, the body, the scripture says in Romans 8, 11, that the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal body. So the more we are in that element then we're going to experience the phase two salvation that we have been many times scratching our head. Huh? Yeah, I, I believe in that. But are you actually, I don't want to sound mystical here, but experiencing it for yourself? Because it's it's a matter of consistency, which is what I'm seeing here. We're I'm seeing that there's a lot of things here that we may not have seen before that requires our volition to submit to his word. Find out what it says, abide. What does it mean? Remain, stay, dwell, to focus on that, be his disciples so that we can experience truth that will ultimately set us free. Coupled with Romans 12, 2, we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind because we can't abide. We can't be his disciples if we're not renovating our mind. And if we're not renovating our mind, if we're not abiding in him, we're not going to be productive. John 15. This is only John 8. Couple, remember, last week was John, uh, Romans 1. So taking all of these things, once we utilize it together, then we're going to harness the spiritual empowerment that comes through a mind that is rightly adjusted to the spirit so that we can experience life and peace. So here's that verse I wanted you to see. Now, he who keeps his commandments, notice this. He who keeps his commandments abides in him. So the one who abides in him is the person who is keeping his commandments. So if you're not keeping his commandments, you're therefore not abiding in him. So he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him, there's that reciprocal fellowship, that relationship, relationship that is related to fellowship. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given to us. So in first John three is talking about, we'll know that we're abiding in him and he in us by the spirit. And in um, Romans eight, we're told that the spirit in who, that indwells us will give life to our mortal body. So when we tie this together, we're starting to see that the Holy Spirit can be a very real part of our lives. It's not some mystical thing. It's a reality that comes as a result of stepping out in faith, committing to him in faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Remember Romans 10, 17. So as we make application to the doctrines that we're learning here, abiding in this truth, then we will experience power. But if you look right in front of you, 1 John 3, 24, he who keeps his commandments abides in him. 
So the question I have for myself and for you is, are you keeping his commandments? Do you know what the commandments are? Because by doing so, you therefore are abiding in him. And then as a result of that, he's abiding in you. What's that? That's called fellowship, right? So it's not just First John 1, 9, and you're, you're filled with the spirit. That's part of it. That's not the end. See, we, we sometimes say, oh, all we get is rebound, rebound, rebound. Confess, and we'll be filled with the spirit. But look what it says here. He who keeps his commandments abides in him. If we're not keeping his commandments, we're not therefore abiding in him. So now you got to go back and rebound again. You got to confess because you're not keeping his commandments. Because as we've seen in John, the abiding there is an imperative. That's a command. So are you abiding in him to be productive? If not, you've been out of fellowship all this time and you may not have even known it. And if that's true, you're not in phase two. You're not experiencing the power that can be yours as a result of aligning your will with his, aligning your, your decisions based on biblical truth. So this is where we're going to stop because we're out of time. And uh, we will resume this next week. So let's close in a word of prayer. And I appreciate your time. Hopefully you're enjoying this because I'm wanting us to live in victory with much power so that we can accomplish much. He said he's, we're going to do greater works than him, than he. And that's, of course, um, because of the God, Holy, God, the Holy Spirit. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word and to be reminded that the power uh, for the spiritual life comes from you and your word. And so as we're seeing more and more of how this is contingent upon our volition, I pray, Lord, that we would be open to these things so that we can make application, thus bringing you the glory, as Jesus had communicated to his disciples, that when we abide in your word, in you, then we will honor and glorify you by bearing much fruit. So we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be gathered together. And I pray for every person that's listening right now that you would, uh, as you're searching their heart and you see where they are, spiritually speaking, that you would help them make adjustments where necessary. And if there's anybody that is uh, going through some hardship of any kind, be it physical, financial, relational, I pray, Lord, that you would intervene and uh, exercise the phase two salvation and give the empowerment that comes through the spirit of God as they're listening right now. Thank you for being with us and loving us and uh, never abandoning us. And we love you and we ask all of these things through Christ's matchless name in which we pray, amen. You guys have a good Sunday afternoon and I will see you next week. God bless you all. Bye-bye.